Hi, everyone. My name is Jen with Slope Garden Center. Happy Wednesday evening. It's our first Wednesday evening webinar presentation, and I've been looking forward to this all day long. I don't know if that's weird, but I'm really happy to uh, have this presentation tonight. It's at this perfect time for me that's sort of like right at the end of my work day and right before I'm gonna start making dinner. And so I just think this is a really cool time to talk about the garden. Um, I do wanna take a moment and talk about a few things. First of all, tonight we I'm happy to have back the dynamic duo of Suzanne Bontempo and Charlotte Canner. I love when they are here. They are so informative and I learn every class. So um, we're gonna be talking about managing gardens through a drought, which is um, very real for us. And it's becoming something that's pretty real every year. So the more tools that we have, uh, the better we can handle and the better our gardens can handle through the drier months. So I'm really looking forward to what they have to share. Um, I do want to let you know that I have a poll going on right now. So if you all could pop over into the poll and fill out some of the questions, we do want some of the information before the presentation starts. So I'd really appreciate you taking a moment to do that. Um, I want to note that next week starts our summer garden spotlight series. Again, this is something that I'm really excited about. Um, in this series, we're highlighting local businesses and artists that integrate an aspect of the garden in their practice. And to me, I think it's cool to just sort of like build this community of sort of garden related things and sort of expand, um, expand that. And so I'm hoping you think so too. We're going to kick off the summer spotlight series next week with garden cocktails. Um, and there's a supply list on our website and, um, you know, I would say pick, pick one of, uh, Josh will be doing three different cocktails. I'd say pick one, get your supplies, you know, we'll all just, I think that'll be fun to do next Wednesday evening. Um, there's discount codes too for the bidders. So that's just another way to support the community, um, business. And then I have also in that series after that, a farm to table um, chef that's gonna come on and share a fun summer recipe. So again, I'm really excited about these classes and I hope you'll be joining us. Um, for this class tonight, you all should have received a outline and a supply list in your reminder email that you received about an hour ago. So there should be a link to that. So you have that um, to, to follow along with the class. And if you have any questions, feel free to drop them into the Q&A and we'll be going through them. The thing, when, when us three are all able to work together, it's nice because Two of us can answer questions while the third person is talking and we just you know we're, we like to cover as much as possible and be as supportive to you as much as possible so feel free to keep um keep your questions coming uh a reminder that the recording for this will be available this friday so that's different than normally our saturday webinars so um this will be available this Friday, June 4th. It's so crazy, it's June. Anyway, um, let's look at the poll results really quick. Okay, one sec. Um, okay, so 52% have attended a slope uh, webinar before, which means 49%, well, 51, 52, 48 or 49% have not. So welcome. We're so happy to have you here. Um, and then 67% have not heard of Oh Wow before, Our Water, Our World. So again, we're really happy that you're joining us um, because it's a really awesome organization that you need to know about and hear about what they do. Um, and then, do you use water in your garden? 
from 83% say hose, uh, 33% use water from indoor harvesting from the sink or shower. 13% um, use a rain catchment system and 4% use a gray water system. 11% none of the above. Okay. Um, what do you see is the most effective way to save or reduce water in the garden? 84% said all of the above. So um, and then next to that, using bar 5% was the next, uh, next in line, and that was using bark to retain moisture. Um, watering less frequently after that and planting drought tolerant plants. Okay, thank you so much. This is super helpful information. And uh, Suzanne and Charlotte, I'm really looking forward to your presentation. Thank you for being here and take it away. Thanks, Jen. Thanks everyone for spending your early evening afternoon with us. Um, we are both, Suzanne and I are both really excited to be here. So we're gonna go through a lot of information. Hopefully we'll fit it all in about 45, 50 minutes, but um, it is gonna be a little bit intense. So uh, apologies in advance, but um, hopefully we'll, we'll keep your attention. And if you have attended a previous the previous webinar, um, our WaterWise webinar that we did with Sloat a few we uh, weeks or months back. Um, the recording is available, and that is going to be the basis of a lot of this information. But we're going to go, we're going to kind of expand on some of the things we talked about, look at a little differently, um, and hopefully give you some more information. So if you already saw that webinar, you have a fantastic foundation for this one. If you haven't, no big deal. You can always watch it on our re recording, and you'll get a lot of good information from this one. So today we're going to talk a lot about how to use our water efficiently um, and then some tools for conserving water and protecting our plants in um, a time of drought, which unfortunately we are in. Uh, but first, I will introduce the 49% of you that don't know about water, our, our water world. Actually, I don't know if that was the right percentage, but whatever. Anyway, um, our water world is a program um, sponsored by different counties. Uh, it is designed to bring awareness between pesticides and water quality and provide pest problem solving education. So in a lot of, um, we partner with stores, uh, retail stores in many different counties um, to provide information for you, the customer. Uh, what you'll see in many stores is the uh, 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 info rack of fact sheets, like the one on the left, that photo on the left with information about common pests and other uh, garden issues. Also, many stores have these blue tags uh, that you'll see in the bottom middle or on the right. Those are gonna highlight the eco-friendly products on the shelf. And then you can also visit ourwaterourworld.org to see all the fact sheets in PDF form and uh, get more information about where, what um, stores partner with Our Water World and more information about different products. So a quick intro to integrated pest management, not totally what we're talking about today, but it's all connected and it is going to, what we're talking about today is going to help you with your pests in um, the garden. So integrated pest management is um, a way of looking at the garden more holistically as a whole and asking a lot of questions um, and taking certain steps before we reach for, you know, a product on the shelf. First step is always identification. If we see we have a, um, a bug or a pest, uh, we wanna identify it, make sure it is a pest and not maybe a good bug um, that we want to in turn nurture in our garden. Um, prevention, that's a lot of what we're gonna talk about today. There's a lot of things we can do in the garden before pests arrive um, that will keep populations down going forward. Um, so that's increasing the health of the garden, um, really just understanding timing of certain pests, understanding that aphids are springtime, so we know they're going to happen and there's some things we can do um, to take uh, action before they come to be less, for our garden to be less attractive for them. Um, we're monitoring always, taking, um, you know, taking walks in our gardens, studying our gardens, looking for, for pests um, and other issues. 
And then if we want to take some action, there are um, the cultural controls, which are really prevent prevention. Uh, then there's mechanical controls, which are using tools, physical barriers, traps, um, uh, fencing, gopher wire, uh, physical things that we can use in the garden to keep pests away from our homes or our plants. Biological controls, which are really um, encouraging other uh, organisms like good bugs, birds, snakes, lizards, um, other critters in the garden to help us keep pests down. And then there's chemical controls, which are pesticides. Um, and they're always going to be used as a last resort. We're always going to go for the most eco-friendly product that we can, and we're going to use it as little as possible. And then evaluating is a really important part of integrated pest management. If once we take some action, we want to make sure we're checking, did our actions make a difference or do we need to try something new? All right, so, and then talking about watersheds, why are we talking, why are we talking about pesticides and watersheds? Uh, well, there is a direct connection and that's what our water world really um, hopes to bring to the attention of customers or of, of gardeners. Um, first, a watershed is really any area that, um, uh, any land, big and small, that drains into a body of water. So that could be an area that drains into a creek, um, or it could be as large as, for example, the San Francisco Bay watershed, which we in the Bay Area are located in. Massive watershed. Half of all water that falls on California drains into the San Francisco Bay. So why is that important? Because most in most counties, any water that um, enters a storm drain, so it doesn't get absorbed into your garden, it hits the, the concrete or the cement and goes into a storm drain, will go straight from the storm drain to a waterway. And so when that's most counties, I will say San Francisco is one exception. It does treat most of the water that enters the storm drain does get treated before it enters a waterway, but that is um, very rare exception, most counties, uh, the water straight, street, storm drain, waterway. <laughs> and so when we think about that, um, it's picking up pesticides, fertilizers, uh, pet waste, motor oil, debris, plastic, um, as it enters those storm drains. And uh, watersheds, big and small, they combine and they drain, like for example, the San Francisco Bay watershed, all of that water um, from, this area drains into the bay. So all that stuff that it takes with it will drain into the bay as well and will end up in the bay. Um, I do want to point out again that I, um, we can think of our, I will, sorry, I'm talking about watersheds again still, but that's okay. Um, we're st we can think of our yards as watersheds as well. So really thinking of um, uh, collecting as much rain as we, we can keeping as much water in our yards as possible. And that's really what we're going to talk about today. Now we can go to the next slide. Thanks, Suzanne. So gardening in California, we're lucky that at least in the Bay Area, uh, we have mild temperatures all year round. So we really can garden all year round, which is such a treat. But uh, we do need to um, understand that it's we have a summer dry climate. And so it's very normal for us to not get any precipitation for five or six months out of the year. June through September, usually no little to no precipitation. Um, and then hopefully some rain or snow um, in the winter months. So again, it's, it's normal to have these dry months. So we do need to, and we do need to understand that we can do these water wise practices all year round every year in drought or not because there's periods of time where we won't get any water. But this year, <laughs> we're in a drought. <laughs> I'm sure you all know this. Um, and what this means is that, again, we're not getting, it's, it's different than just having a summer dry climate. There has been very little water uh, and rain and snow last uh, winter, and actually even the winter before that was not that wet. Um, which makes it so that the Bay Area is in either extreme drought or in exceptional drought conditions right now. Uh, kind of a scary map. 
So um, what this means and how, why this, how this is measured really is because the snowpack, the area, the snow that falls in the Sierras, we usually rely on that for a third to, or it's like 30 to 40% of California's water. Uh, we rely on the snowpack for that. And this year, um, the snowpack was measured in April and it was about 60% of what it should be. So that's, um, you know, significantly less than uh, what, we're, what we're hoping for. So, um, and what's also happening is that the past years have been pretty dry as well. So that um, what's extra concerning this year is that when that snowpack is melting, um, usually, usually what happens, it, the snowpack melts slowly over the summertime and it recharges the reservoirs as we use the reservoirs. But this year, the reservoirs are quite low to start and the snow is melting on dry soil because the past years have been drier than normal. So when that snow melts, it hits the dry soil, it absorbs into that soil and that's where it stays. It doesn't trickle down and refill those reservoirs. So that's the big concern that we're not getting recharged um, as we were hoping. Not to be all doomsday, but that's just the situation that's happening, why it's different than a normal summer here. And so um, to understand what's happening then in our garden, when plants are stressed because of drought and lack of consistent water, uh, a few things happen. They, uh, one thing that, ha that happens is that they close their pores or stomata, these little pores on the leaves. Um, they close them up because they don't want to release any of the moisture that they already have inside them. So because they, they uh, I don't forgot the real term transpire, I guess, or evapor I don't know, evapor transpire, I forgot the word, um, through their leaves. But in times of stress of uh, drought, they close the pores up to keep that water inside. Because they close the pores up, they can't properly photosynthesize because they can't absorb the carbon dioxide in the air and go through the photosynthesis process. So that because they're slowing down, they slow um, their growth. They're not photosynthesizing, they slow their growth. Um, also, they, um, they uh, kind of, <laughs> they um, have other functions where they still slow um, their, they'll make their leaves smaller. They'll, um, they'll kind of just, um, react. <laughs> I don't know the word. Oh, they, that's another thing. Sorry. They um, expand their roots. They uh, grow more roots as well because they're really trying to get as much water under the soil as possible. Apologize for that. Okay. So other things that happens is that um, when there's limited water, the plant can't move uh, food around and food and minerals around as well. So they grow slower. They don't produce food as well. Um, stressed plants can also release chemicals that um, are attracted to, to pests and they also don't have as many defenses um, which pests can identify and will um, take advantage of that. And then the heat, the more heat can actually accelerate reproduction time of pests so that um, you might actually get more generations of pests in a season than, than normal. And then other things that happen that plants will show they are stressed from drought is again, that will slow their growth. Their leaves might lose that green color. Um, they might drop their leaves. Trees and shrubs might have a thinning crown and there will be less um, shoot growth as well. And then um, some common pests that we'll see normally but even more so um, in drier conditions. And when plants are water stressed are um, spider mites, thrips, powdery mildew, and white fly. Because um, again, they can't, these plant, these pests thrive in dry, dusty conditions and the plants tend to um, give off kind of a stress hormone thing that pests can um, identify. And so that's what attacks them as well. Suzanne, you want to add anything to that? No, that was awesome. That was such a tough uh, couple of slides. It's hard to um, make um, science uh, 
to uh, articulate science in like normal gardening terms. So thank you everyone. Uh, <laughs> yeah, that was great. Um, so now let's look at water. So what I'd like to share is a little bit on um, how we can use water efficiently um, to keep our gardens healthy. And essentially um, effective or efficient, I'm sorry, efficient irrigation or efficient watering is determined by how effectively the water is applied. And the intention that I really, um, that we would like to actually um, express is that we really, the intention of water wise gardening or um, having a drought resilient garden is to get the water where it's really meant to go. And so um, we want to look at how we can conserve water and strategies for watering properly. Strategies we want to share how to really, I guess, um, utilize that water when we are watering our garden and making sure it's going to keep the plants um, healthy through times of stress. And watering during a drought does not mean that we're watering less. It doesn't mean we're watering more, but we're watering really strategically, very wisely. So um, Water is important to plants for a number of reasons. Um, it is this with the plant's ability to access nutrients. It also helps the root systems expand and grow and get into areas of the soil where they can, can access more water. Um, working with automatic watering systems or using some type of a timer on the end of the hose bib that then um, will help with uh, watering uh, is going to help us water more efficiently because we're able to limit or exactly time the amount of water that we need to apply to the garden as opposed to just like, you know, we have turned on, you know, a, like the soaker hose and then we forgot to set a timer like on our phone or something and then we've totally forgot and now it's like hours later and we're like, oh crap, uh, uh, shoot, we've totally forgot. It's just been watering. So taking advantage of like timers is really going to help us save water as well. And then the most important time to water is going to be early in the day when the soil temperatures and the air temperatures are cool. It's really important to um, water when there is enough daylight hours for any water that might have gotten on top of any leaves that has maybe sprinkled on leaves to dry before sundown. Because we want to reduce any risk of diseases such as black spot or rust. And so there's a lot of different ways to get water out into our gardens. One of them is just by hand watering. I'm a big fan of hand watering. Um, I also have an irrigation system. But when we hand water, we want to make sure that we're watering the soil. We want to water the root zone. We want to avoid watering the leaves. And the reason why is because if those water particles haven't evaporated, then there's going to be a risk of increasing diseases, um, such as the a black spot and rust, but we really want to focus that water around the root zone. And then uh, it's really important to uh, include or add one of these little hose and shutoff valves or you work with a, a trigger nozzle, uh, like have lots of all the wands nowadays have either a shutoff valve, either that is thumb controlled or it's like a trigger nozzle or there is one that has a little arm, these are going to help us save water quite a bit. You know, if we have to drop that hose for a minute, we can immediately turn that water off without wasting any water. And then irrigation systems. So irrigation systems um, are only going to help us um, if we're able to program them uh, efficiently and effectively. These are not set it and forget it systems. We wanna make sure we understand how much water is coming out. If we have the irrigation clock set for 8 a.m. for 30 minutes, we wanna understand what is the volume of water that's coming out. Uh, have I been able to get enough water to actually uh, penetrate down a good anywhere from five to 12 inches, depending on what the plant material is and what it's the needs of that plant are. 
irrigation systems are going to help us if we're working with the drip irrigation localize the water so we're very specific and precise about where we are getting that water it allows us to also um, provide nice deep watering uh, typically the irrigation lines can be right underneath a layer of mulch so it really keeps that water from evaporating it's making direct contact with the soil and um, again we can set the timers for early in the morning when the air is cool and the soil is cool. And if we have challenging areas like a slope or if we have um, soil that is a little uh, um, harder like clay, we can set the clocks for multiple uh, start times so that we can allow that water to slowly infiltrate. We want to still get that water deep but over a slower amount of time. And so we're going to talk about irrigation emitters for a second. So both of these um, are ways that water can be, uh, you know, re being released from the emitters, uh, either the PE tubing that has an inline emitter that's going to release some water, or sometimes the PE tubing doesn't have inline emitters. We're just connecting that quarter inch spaghetti tubing to it. And then the spaghetti tubing is going to have an emitter. And the question I just like to bring um, up and help you be aware of is how much is, what's the flow rate? How much water is actually coming out of that emitter? Is it a half a gallon per hour? Is it a one gallon per hour? Or is it a two gallon? Gallon per hour because if we have that clock set for 30 minutes and it's a half a gallon per hour that's just going to be a quart of water whereas the two gallon per hour that's a whole gallon of water so it's a huge difference that's a big range so please get curious and identify how much water is really coming out of your irrigation system if you are using a system like this and then from there, we want to focus the water around the drip line. We've mentioned it probably in every program. Um, it is so important. I know this is uh, referencing trees, but this will apply to just about any plant. So we really want to water those new fibrous root hairs. And those fibrous root hairs are going to be on the outer perimeters of the drip line. So we want to focus the water right where the edge of the canopy of the plant is. And it could be a perennial, it could be a shrub, it could be a rose, it could be you know any plant you can think of all the way out. So we're going to really uh, try to reach that water around evenly the drip line of the plant. And we want to encourage deep roots. So when we water shallowly, understand that that water can evaporate very quickly. And over time, that can cause quite a bit of stress on the plant. Also understand the roots are just going to go where the water goes. So what we want to do is really encourage nice, deep root systems. And it, you know, if this is a newly planted plant, it could take a while for those root systems to become established. So keep that in mind. What we want to really get in the um, habit of is watering deeply and infrequently because when there's times of excessive heat or drought stress, those root systems are established, they're deep. They are um, able to access water much deeper than what has dried out at the top few inches of the soil. So here's another way of looking at it. This is a really awesome graph that I found on Robert Kurtz, uh, one of his books, Roots to the Mystified. I just love it. Um, of course, these are vegetable crops, but it's just a good idea to see that root systems really can expand deep. Now, the squares on this graph are a foot. So um, we're looking at tomatoes. They can expand down four feet. Um, you know, so something just to keep in mind that it's really going to um, give us a lot of depth. Um, sorry. Ah. Uh, it's, we really want to get the uh, water down to some depth. Now, I'm not suggesting that we water to the point of the water getting four feet, but again, we want to look at getting that water down anywhere from five to 12 inches. It will continue to move down. The microbiology in the soil will assist, but we're really trying to get the water down a little deeper and we're not watering again until the top few inches has dried. And that's really challenging. Um, it's something that we forget about and that we, you know, often um, overlook. 
So as the plants grow, we're going to water a little differently. So um, not different, not very different from when we have um, an infant, a baby in the house, we're going to be feeding that baby regularly. Pretty much that baby, all it's doing is sleeping and eating. But as that infant grows, it, you know, into adulthood, we can pretty much get away with, um, you know, maybe even one meal a day. Now that's not ideal, but we can get away with it. Now think about their seedlings. Now there is on the little seedling that just germinated on the left, there's hardly any root system. So we are watering very frequently uh, because that water is evaporating out of that soil very quickly. Frequently. However, as that plant matures, we're able to get that water a little deeper down to about four inches. And now we can let that soil dry out about an inch before we need to water again. And when we buy plants at the garden center, they're going to most likely be in the form of the pot. So here is this plant that I purchased and it's in the form of the, of the pot. The root system is pretty dense. So I'm using um, these tags to like score the roots to make sure I can open up those root systems because I want to encourage those roots to start to grow out and down. I really want to establish a nice balanced, healthy root system. And I'm going to do that by amending the soil and watering deeply. All right, so I actually have already seen some Q&A questions come in about how much, how, how frequent is frequent. And um, so hopefully these next few slides will help some of those people get their answer. Um, so again, the tags that Suzanne was just pointing out, when you're at the garden center, you can look at these tags. They have a lot of information about the needs of the plant um also talks about how much water they need so and what you'll see is um maybe some of these terms no water once established low water regular or ample um, no water once established really means that so first we'll just say getting established as the plants get established they're going to need a lot more water than once they are mature adults and using uh suzanne's metaphor <laughs> again um so, and just to, to share, perennials take about a year to be established. Uh, small and medium shrubs are, take about two years to be established and trees take four to five years to be established. So, um, and the younger they are, the more water and you can taper it off as they get older. So no water once established means once that plant is an adult, you no water, none. We, you'll kill the plant if you water it. Low water uh, is more like watering it thoroughly and then drying it, letting it dry really, like really dry out, um, close to bone dry before watering it again. Regular or moderate water, um, you're gonna just let it dry out a couple inches depending on the, the size of the plant. You know, trees can go a little bit more, but um, uh, just a few, two, three, four inches depending on the size of the plant will be dry before you water again. And ample, that means they like to be moist pretty much all the time. You still do want to let the, in, the top inch or so dry out because um, you don't want that uh, plant sitting in soggy soil. You never want soggy soil. Um, but um, other than that, you will want to water it a lot. And then um, there are a lot of resources online to help figure out a schedule. Um, based and there's a lot of for different counties they have um, lots of resources um, and it talks about different um, the schedules based on you know the month of the year if you're in a foggy or warmer climate um, the 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 system you have or the plants that you're watering it'll give you an estimate of how to um, schedule that but these are just a starting point because <laughs> we can't depend on those schedules. Use them as a starting point only, try the schedule out, but you really do wanna continue to monitor your garden thoroughly um, as you're watering because your garden um, has microclimates. Uh, there might be a very sunny area. It might be a shady, cooler area. So your watering is gonna be different in each of those areas. Um, how established the plant is. Again, if it's, you just put it in the ground or it's six months old, it might need different, have different needs. The texture of your soil, clay, loam, or sand, or a mixture of those. You do wanna know that because that's gonna also change how you water. 
Um, and then, yeah, if you have mulch or other just general conditions of your soil are gonna um, affect how you, how you water. So start with the schedule and then really observe. Um, and then just to elaborate on the soil texture, what you do want to know what kind of soil you have because water moves through soil very differently. If you have clay soil, it's going to have trouble infiltrating and it's going to kind of spread out and pool a little bit um, and then will infiltrate very slowly. Whereas sand, um, if you have sandy soil, it's just going to rush right through it. It's going to infiltrate quick and brush through very deeply quickly. Um, and if you have some mixture, it might change. <laughs> a mixture of the clay, loam, sand, it will be slightly different. So you do want to understand that because that will affect your um, watering. For example, if you have clay, you're going to want to, and you have an irrigation system, you're going to want to pulse the water. You're going to want to water a little bit, wait till it, the water infiltrates and it's not pooling anymore, then water again. Um, especially that first watering, the water will pool more and then it will infiltrate easier after the first watering. Awesome. Yeah. Imagine that the soil is kind of like a sponge. So it always takes a little bit of time for the water to start to absorb. So sometimes what we do is we'll like water an area and then we'll water other areas and we'll come back and rewater that area. So that's something you can also consider. But yeah, um, sadly, we can't tell you how much to water because you're the only one that knows. And that's what we're trying to help you understand that we get out there and we observe and we look and we check stuff out. But I'm really excited to talk a little bit about different ways we can use water, different ways we can source water because this is one of my favorite topics. So um, we want to look at different ways to reuse or recycle water. And one easy way is just the bucket in the bathroom or the kitchen that we then can fill our watering cans outside, or we can, um, you know, water our plants around the garden with that water. Gray water systems, I'm going to talk a little bit more about laundry to landscape, which is so easy to install, no permits needed. And then, of course, rain catchment systems, which uh, you know, we want to look forward to when we get rains and keeping that water on site whenever possible. So let's look at using some gray water systems. So laundry to landscape is uh, very, very easy to install. Like I said, no permit is necessary. There's three amazing resources that we have at our fingertips, which is the Urban Farmer Store throughout the Bay Area, Gray Water Action, and the San Francisco PUC, which is um, their website, sfwater.org. All three have teamed up to get information and specifically the PDF of a manual that will walk you through step-by-step how to install uh, gray water systems that's appropriate for you. So here's a couple of things I can share is that really it's super easy laundry to landscape. You just wanna make sure that the washing machine is against a shared wall with your yard, with the outside space. And we also wanna make sure that that washing machine is above grade or at grade. We don't want to water um, our garden from our washing machine that's slightly above grade because it's going to put a lot of stress on the motor of that washing machine. Then what we want to do is install a three-way valve. Three-way valves are a little tricky to find, but I know you can get them at the Urban Farmer Store and then some plumbing supply stores and other irrigation su supply stores. But what I've discovered is that most hardware stores don't have them, but they can special order them. And the three-way valve is now allowing you to either have the water go out to the garden or we can turn that valve and we can direct it to the sewer. So you don't have to uh, release every load of laundry. All of that water does not have to go to the garden. Um, you get to choose which loads go to the garden. Also, you might have had a day where you were working with something that was a little uh, 
toxic or I, I don't even really know an example, but something where, or you want to use bleach in your laundry soap that time. And so then you want to direct that load to the sewer, but you get to control how much goes out to the garden. And what's so wonderful is because most of our laundry washing machines really are releasing a lot of water. It's a great opportunity to water trees, um, hedges of shrubs, fruit trees, anything that really likes a lot of water and like a nice deep soak. And then we don't have to uh, water again. You don't have to direct that water out for until that soil has dried. But the other caveat is that we want to make sure that we are using gray water compatible laundry detergents. Um, you really want to do your research here because um, some of the soaps say that they're gray water compatible, but if you read the ingredients, you'll start to see that there's a lot of salts and salts are not going to be um, uh, plant friendly or soil friendly. So do your research. Uh, the Gray Water Action website has a complete list of what's going to really work for you. And then from there, I just would, I can't say enough how incredible it is to capture as much water as we can when it rains. Um, an inch of rainfall over a thousand square foot surface like our roof can capture over 600 gallons of water. So this is free water that is excellent for watering our plants. The, uh, rain catchment systems, you can, um, um, install uh, the first flush filter or they are going to come with it. So there's different systems, but you can find the uh, best one for you. And there are rain catchment systems for any garden. This one I just think is so cool. This is from the Urban Farmer website. Um, these are, I believe they're Bushmen and they're just lined up against the back of a fence with a screen of hedges in front. And you would not even know that you had this lineup of rain catchment, but that's thousands of gallons of water that they're able to capture and use throughout the year, all of the dry months when we're not getting any rain. All right. All right, so now let's look at a few questions and common mistakes. Um, a lot of the question, some of the, sometimes you might want to know, are you watering or underwatering? Um, it's hard to tell sometimes. So really you just have to investigate a little bit further. I've had the experience where I'm like, I watered and it looks wet to me. And then I dig down a little bit and it's completely dry. So there's something going on there. So, um, and then the opposite can happen where you, which we'll talk about where the surface will look dry, but you dig down and it's nice and moist. So it's really investigate, dig it down with your hands or get a moisture meter. Um, if you don't wanna dig down, these meters are available at most hardware stores um, and nurseries to um, help you with that question. Um, and again, just like this, it might look dry on the surface, but if you dig down, um, the soil is going to be damp underneath. Well, it might be damp underneath. It's worth checking though before you water again. And then just a reminder that overwatering um, plants can also cause plants to wilt. So if you see your plant looks really sad, um, you might check the soil before you try watering it again. I know you want, it's easy to just be like, oh, I gotta get water on this quick check the soil, it might have been overwatered. Um, that also causes plants to kind of close up their pores also, and then that leads to wilt. Um, so uh, just check before you water again. It also could be a gopher. I've seen that before. Yeah, if it's, if it's healthy one day and then the next day it's sad, just pick the plant up and see if it has any roots left. <laughs> I've been seeing that a lot lately. All right, and then um, again, when we're monitoring our gardens, we're also monitoring for any type of leaks. So we wanna check for leaks. We wanna investigate and make sure again that the water is going where it's meant to go. That is the intention, right? So it's always nice to have some, um, you know, goof plugs and compression fittings on hand just to do quick repairs. And so you can get around to properly repairing it or oftentimes this is the proper way to repair uh, any of our irrigation, um, uh, you know, um, little, you know, um, 
whenever we cut a line or by accident you know, or anything like that. And then of course, this is really important. We want to eliminate um, uh, runoff and overspray. And so this is a huge, huge, huge issue. Uh, if this is what's happening on your garden, you really want to make sure it's not. We can adjust those sprinkler heads. We can change the length of time that we're watering. Maybe we want to pulse that water out where we uh, are, you know, watering shorter periods of time, but more, you know, frequent over a time frame of like uh, a morning. So maybe we're watering five minutes, letting that water uh, absorb. We're watering five more minutes, letting that water absorb so that we can get the volume of water out but through, we're, you know, we're pulsing it because we want to avoid runoff. I also know some municipalities are starting to uh, mention that if you see a neighbor that has runoff or if, you know, they can report it and we don't want to get there, you know, we just want to take care of this to, you know, so that it doesn't happen. And then we always want to adjust the irrigation. We do not want to water the crown of the plants. We really want to bring the irrigation emitters out and water that drip line. That's going to be really important. So we want to adjust the irrigation as the plants grow to prevent crown rot and other diseases and pathogens that could really be detrimental to our plants. All right, so now we'll talk more about some tools for conserving water. So really keeping that water in the soil, because once it gets there, um, it's feeding the microbiology, it's feeding our plants, um, it's even keeping our property safer from uh, wildfires. So we really want to keep that water in the soil as much as we can. We can do that by adding organic material, using um, a mulch, and focusing on the right plants in the right place, as we always talk about in these webinars, and uh, monitoring our garden, pulling weeds, and taking care of our gardens um, properly. So compost, my favorite subject always. Um, compost is amazing. It helps us um, even in, in, especially in times of drought. Um, it helps all year round. It will always provide your plants with nutrients. It's um, a really wonderful thing to always be adding to your soil. But in times of drought, Compost is essential because it turns your soil into a sponge. Um, any kind of soil you have, it will help your soil hold on to any moisture that gets into that soil and keeps it there to provide for the microbiology and the roots and your plant's roots so that they can get it when they need it. Um, compost can hold five times its weight in water. So when you add it um, to your soil, just think of it as a sponge. <laughs> There's no better way to say it, it's a sponge. And um, just to demonstrate how soil can help any kind of, or sorry, compost can help any kind of soil you have, whether it's, if you have clay, it can really break up the clay particles. So instead of having that really impenetrable surface of the soil, the clay, what it does is it breaks up the particles and it creates pore spaces for water, air, and roots to infiltrate. And then if you have sandy soil, instead of, you know, water just rushing through it, things just rushing through it because there's so much um, space between the particles and the particles don't hold together very well, compost acts like a glue and it brings the particles together to really hold that water and slow that water down um, and keep it there in the soil. And I will add a, a statistic that I just learned. If you increase your soil organic matter by 1%. The soil organic matter is really the amount of organic matter in the soil, which is usually made of compost. 1% holds 16,000 gallons of water per acre with to a depth of one foot. And that's really where we need it, is that one foot where the most of the plant roots are. So I think that hopefully that's a, just adding a little bit of compost is gonna really increase this, the holding capacity of your soil. And then um, mulch. So we're going to use mulch, preferably an organic mulch like bark um, or uh, arbor mulch, tree. I can't think of the other one. Wood chips. That's the word I was going for. Sorry. <laughs> Wood chips and bark mulch are excellent um, because they're organic. They'll break down in the soil. They'll help your soil in other ways, but they really hold in that water that does get into the soil. Um, it prevents that evaporation. 
Also dry soil is hydrophobic, meaning like if you water it, uh, sometimes the water, you might notice the water doesn't enter the soil very quickly. It kind of pools or runs, runs off. Mulch can really help that because it'll just hold that water in place as it slowly infiltrates. Um, it reduces evaporation. Two inches of, of mulch can cut water usage by roughly 20%. And mulch really regulates the soil temperature. It acts like a blanket or as a layer of insulation. So both in hot and cold temperatures, it keeps the soil um, temperatures more regulated, which means for the plant roots, the temperature is more regulated, which is better for your plant. Your plant doesn't want to go through those crazy temperature swings. And two inches of mulch can also lower the soil temperature on the top four inches of soil about 10 degrees. So it's a 90 degree day, but you have two inches of soil. Your soil is more like 80 degrees, which your plants will like much more. And then organic fertilizers, we've talked about this in many webinars. We recommend using them all year round for many benefits that they provide, sustainable food uh, to your plants, help your plants grow nice and hearty. But it's really important, especially during times of low water um, and drought, because synthetic fertilizers, um, and those are the fertilizers that when you mix them with water, the water is like blue or green, or they're made of multicolored beads. Um, those are the synthetic fertilizers. Uh, they are very high in salt. So using them frequently in your soil are gonna in is gonna increase the salt levels in that top two inches of soil. Um, which is going to inhibit your plant's ability to take up water and nutrients. So we do want to avoid those. And growing natives, um, plants that are already uh, suited for this environment, suited for the dry summers um, and the well, hopefully moisture winters will already be able to tolerate um, a bit more dryness in the summer. There's also more drought tolerant varieties that you can get, California natives or Mediterranean natives, because we also live in a Mediterranean climate. Um, there's also varieties that you can choose that are more pest and disease resistant. Um, and reminder again, I already mentioned microclimates, but when you are choosing plants for your garden, you do want to really study your garden to understand even your your yard has microclimate, so you do want to put your plants in the right place, right plant, right place, because um, in addition to drought tolerance, they are going to be happier and healthier if they are in the conditions that they're suited for. And um, a fun suggestion for more water-wise veggie gardening is to choose heirloom varieties, because there are a lot of heirlooms that are suited to the Mediterranean uh, climate. So they can still grow, but have maybe less, have less access, need less access to water. And there's so many varieties, it's pretty exciting. And you can get some really creative, cool veggies out of that too. Some resources for you, we, um, you have these in a resource page um, that Jen will send out. Uh, so you don't need to write these down, but just to review, there's the Arboretum All -Star Stars, which is a plant list, um, a searchable database of plants. Uh, the California Native Plant Society can help find some drought tolerant options for you. The local master gardeners um, will have, can answer questions and have lots of resources on um, their pages. There's Marin, Contra Costa, and uh, San Mateo, um, and Alameda, I believe too. There's, and then there's a saving water partnership, which will have more resources and ideas for saving water in the garden and the home. And then this really wonderful book, Plants and Landscapes for Summer Dry Climates that you can get um, at Sloat um, and most nurseries are most, I would say most, yeah, nurseries or garden centers. No, 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 <laughs> sorry. I thought I've seen it around, not most. Sloat and through uh, East Bay Mud. <laughs> sorry about that. Yeah. Some garden centers, but some it's not really the most popular one. It's really the only place I've seen it available for sale is Slope. Or you can get it, um, yeah, at the East Bay Mud website. Okay, sorry. sorry. I think I've seen it at Urban Farmer Store as well. <laughs> Maybe. <laughs> um, all right, other tools are just, you know, timing. So if you are doing new plantings, maybe take advantage of the cooler temperatures, the less 
uh, the shorter daytime hours and the rainier weather of the fall and winter. Because again, those younger plants are going to need more water and less stress, of course, to uh, get established. So if they're getting regular water through rainy season, there is a lot more moisture in the soil because it's not as hot and it's um, and there's not as much daylight, then they will have that time to be established. And then um, there's also the option of just removing or reducing the size of your lawn. Um, lawns are water, uh, they are big water users. So uh, a thousand square foot lawn needs about 500 gallons of water per week, which is five times more than a perennial garden of the same size. So um, you can consider removing your lawn or reducing the size of the lawn. Um, there are some really wonderful resources out there for lawn replacements, um, either in similar, you know, more drought tolerant grasses or just other ground covers, other options for you. And some counties do have lawn replacement rebates as well, which we'll touch on later. All right, thank you, Charlotte. And this is a lot of information, but we're getting there, everyone. We're getting there, we're almost done. So, um, as we've been mentioning, it's also really important to get out into the garden and monitor. So we want to remove diseased leaves. We want to, um, you know, if we see powdery mildew, we want to wipe it off or remove those older leaves that are covered with powdery mildew. Or in the morning, we want to hose it off, water that plant, water those spores because powdery mildew thrives in summer dry. They like the, it likes the warmth, it likes the dry. And when we can water it uh, early, enough time for that water to evaporate before sundown, we're able to break those spores. We're gonna clean up any leaf debris uh, so that um, any spores could be um, lingering in the soil or on the leaves that have fallen and then continue to spread. We want to pull the, uh, any weeds that we see because weeds are going to compete for water. And then we want to harvest our food crops when they're ready. We really want to harvest them and enjoy them so that we can, um, so that they're not going to be taking up more resources than necessary. And then I'm going to, uh, finish by talking about different types of tools that are available at the garden centers that can help you protect your plants. So we're going to talk about shade cloth, anti-transparents, and hydrogels. And that's such a tough word to say. I'm not sure why. So first, I want to just share when we um, have uh, moments or times or weeks of excessive heat, it is not unusual for our plants to get sunburned. It's called sun scald. And when it happens to like uh, leaves on a plant, it looks really unsightly. And I think you're going to want to just feel like you want to get out there and prune it away. However, leave the leaves. Uh, the reason why is because if we remove those leaves, it's now just exposing more leaves, more parts of the plant to get sunburned. Um, we want to of course, we can remove that the fruits or vegetables um, if we're if they're ready for harvest. Uh, that is the ones behind it. So here we have this tomato. If the tomato behind it is ready for harvest, then we can remove the the fruit that's been um, that has the sun scald. But I would leave it until I'm ready to harvest the rest of the fruit in that area. Uh, we can remove dead limbs that may be uh, infected with pests or diseases, uh, but we really want to be very selective, very strategic, and we want to prune very lightly. We want to be very minimal with any of our pruning. The only pruning we really want to do is like maybe opening up some air circulation, airflow from like, you know, I will prune my tomatoes up about a good 12 to 18 inches just to increase some air circulation. But other than that, I'm not going out there and doing a lot of excessive pruning. Um, because that's going to stress the plants out. It also can um, um, create wounds on the plants and also attract pests. So we really want to be rather uh, strategic and very light with our pruning during times of excessive heat. And then we want to take advantage of things like shade cloth. Shade cloth is pretty amazing, but when we use a shade cloth, we want to make sure we're tenting it over our plants and not draping it on top of the plants. And if we have young trees, we're going to want to take advantage of protecting the trunks. Now we can use uh, 
um, plant protectors like IV organics, or we can just do a mixture of 50-50 latex paint and water. And it could be any color as long as it's a light color. So you can use like a light pink or a light green or a tan or white, whatever color you wanna use, as long as it's 50-50 latex paint and water, because we wanna protect those trunks from sun as well. And we're just going to paint it up to about where that first branches will uh, uh, split or the crotch of the plant is, the tree or larger shrubs. And because from there, typically the canopy of the leaves is shading the rest of the plant. And when we are buying a uh, shade cloth, we're going to look for a uh, shade cloth that's going to be anywhere from like 30 to 50%, which will be ideal for protecting vegetables. And then um, for other plants in the garden, we might look at uh, anything um, up to 60%, but really we wanna keep it down into that really 30 to 50% range. Even just 40% is just an all a really nice all-purpose shade cloth. If it's shade loving plants, understand that they're gonna prefer 75% or higher. And just to put it in perspective, we as people are usually looking for 80 to 90%. So that's gonna be ideal for us. And then there's these products on the market that you may be familiar with, you may not. It's the anti-transparency. Um, okay, I'm just gonna leave it at that. These are products that actually, uh, specifically the wilt stop and the cloud cover, they are going to coat the leaf tissue like uh, wax. It's a um, colorless like waxy barrier and that barrier prevents water evaporation. Um, and then, uh, we have these uh, so, uh, soil hydrogels. These are uh, water absorbing polymers that we work into the soil around the root zone that actually are going to reduce uh, watering by 50%. And these polymers will hold over 200 times its weight in water. So there's two types that I've seen on the market. It's the soil moist naturals, which is a starch from um, corn uh, and or wheat. I've also heard maybe yams, but specifically I just looked it up and this one is going to be a start from corn. And this will last about a year, it's biodegradable. Um, and it does an amazing job for helping reduce water usage because it's holding on to water for plants like uh, for any type of like hanging basket or window box or planters containers things that seem to dry out very quickly this is an ideal product to mix into the soil but again we want to definitely follow the directions because a little goes a long way i've had this experience where i've put too much especially the uh, the white uh, polymer uh, granulars where they expand from after I've watered like little ice cubes and it literally pushes the plants out because I didn't read the directions. So read the directions, work the uh, little granulars down around the root zone, uh, not the top couple inches of the soil because remember we want to water the roots not the top couple inches. And it's really going to be a wonderful way to reduce water usage and to uh, keep water in the soil. And then just to share that a drought resilient garden means healthy garden, sorry, healthy water practices means less plant stress means less pests. So I just wanna share that what we're trying to achieve is reducing the stress of our plants. And we do that by efficiently watering our plants, by putting protecting the soil with a nice layer of mulch. We're working with organic fertilizers and feeding the plants through the season. We have already incorporated compost in the soil, so we are golden. And this is all going to keep our plants really resilient to times of excessive heat and drought throughout the season and pretty much year round. We all should be practicing um, these methods almost year round because we live in California and this is just normal. Well, mostly. Um, we wanna monitor for pests and we wanna identify what's going on and manage the problems when it occurs. We wanna make sure that if these pest problems are persisting, then if we do need to use a pesticide, we're always gonna use an eco-friendly pesticide and we're going to only spot treat to manage those problems. We're gonna use those pesticides sparingly to reduce any type of impact on beneficial insects because the beneficial insects are out there helping us keep the uh, pests 
you know, at a minimal. And Charlotte, were you going to add something to that one? I don't remember. Okay. Anyway, so some online resources, of course, it's our water, our world website, the UCIPM website, which is just awesome. It really helps us identify different types of pest problems and how to manage them with the less toxic approach. Bug guide, if you're not familiar with it, if you've got a bug in the garden, you have no idea what it is, take a picture, email it to them. They're awesome. You'll get a reply very quickly, usually in about 30 minutes. And then another really awesome website is the National Pesticide Information Center. Please get curious, understand the type of pesticides you're using, look them up, see how those actives are intended to work, what the mode of action is, and what the toxicity of it is, because you'd be surprised. Uh, eco-friendlies are eco-friendly because they're not causing any harm to the waterways, but they can still impact beneficial insects and other things like that. But for the most part, they're awesome. Okay, then we wanna look at our, through our um, local municipalities for any type of water saving rebates. There are so many, there's money out there on the table for us, you guys. Let's just take advantage of it. Let's get those lawn conversion rebates. Let's get those irrigation equipment rebates. Let's get those uh, irrigation, um, the uh, schedules that are good starting point. Um, and let's also uh, see what else we can employ around our home and garden to save water. So that's it. We, you know, not too bad, only about five minutes over. Sorry for anyone um, that is just like, oh gosh, I gotta go. That was a lot of information. We thank you so much for joining us. We really hope that we've been able to help you make your garden more resilient during times of drought. Thank you. I mean, as always, I really enjoy your classes because I feel that they're super accessible to beginner gardeners and also uh, more advanced gardeners. There's a lot to take away too. So I really value your uh, expertise and how you present it. I think it's awesome. Um, I do kind of want to echo just as a designer, uh, the point that you brought up about uh, how long it takes to establish plants. So a lot of times this time, you know, around this time of the year, people are suddenly thinking like, oh, I need to plant drought tolerant plants. And um, there's a good chance that your established boxwood hedge is going to require less water right now than a little baby sage plant. So just keep that in mind, um, you know, and like Charlotte said, we really say fall is, is the best time to get the plants in the ground. Hopefully we have the rain to help establish them and cut into that water budget a little bit. And so anyway, all good stuff. And I really appreciate you sharing. We do have several questions and I, I would say that um, a couple things are kind of jumping out that people uh, are uh, focusing in on. And one is what we were talking about before we, us three were talking about before we started, but the concern with fire and sort of, you know, when you talk about mulch, are you talking about bark and is that going to be more fire prone? And is there a balance between sort of retaining moisture with bark and that's going to benefit uh, to be, you know, yeah. Thanks. It's for the fire, yeah. or you know what I mean, or different yeah. books that you recommend, things like that. Um, I know Marin Fire on their website uh, has said that mulch is very important and it is not, we're not looking at mulch as being a fire hazard, uh, nor is it going to be necessarily flammable. I'm not sure if it's on the Cal Fire website I, uh, as well, but what we're looking at is the mulch in those pictures that we showed is going to be like a chunky uh, wood chip. Uh, it could be like the mulch um, that we buy in bags, like at Sloat, or it could be something we're getting in bulk at the landscape supply. But what we're going to avoid is something really fine, like um, that fine redwood, uh, which is called sometimes gorilla hair, or like a really fine um, stringy cedar, because these are going to be more flammable. We're looking for like a chip. And when we put that chip down, it's going to hold moisture in and a nice, well hydrated garden is going to be less fire prone. Awesome. Um, and 
I think that you've effectively drilled in the need to uh, add compost to our gardens, which is awesome. I'm glad that that is a huge takeaway. Um, but people want to know, I mean, how often do you add compost? Do you mix it into the soil? Can you just put it on the top layer? Like, how does that actually look? Um, and any more insight you can give us on that? Yeah, I answered some of those questions individually, but that's good because a lot of people had that question. Um, if you have established plants already, but you want to add compost to your soil, I recommend doing that. Um, you don't need to add as much or as frequently, or yeah, you don't need to add compost as frequently to established plants. What you can do is you can apply compost like a mulch, so top, just called top dressing, where you would put it on the like an inch or so um, around the drip line, underneath the plant, around the drip line more or less of the plant and then you could water it in or you can um, just gently dig in the compost to the top couple of inches and that will, and then I would water it in again as well um, because that will help infiltrate the soil as well. I hope that helps. <laughs> but if you're doing a new garden bed, like a veggie bed, you definitely want to mix in that compost to the bed before you plant. And is that, do you have like a percentage? I can't remember if you said, I mean, is it like, are you doing like 50-50 with your native soil or 20? Yeah, you're not doing 50-50. Uh, mm -hmm. It's, oh, we, I didn't talk about this time, but um, usually organic matter is about five to 10% of soil. So if you think of that, like five to 10% of your garden bed. So you're really adding only an inch or an inch really of compost and then digging it in. You don't want a ton of compost because it'll like break down and shrink and then you just won't have anything left in the bed. Right, and I do want to remind everyone that there is uh, recordings available on our website of both Shannon or Charlotte and Suzanne doing a uh, uh, water wise and also composting and also there's other stuff there's insects and disease and everything these they are a wealth of information but all of this is recorded on our website so like they mentioned at the beginning if you saw the prior webs uh, webinars it, it was a good foundation for this if you haven't seen them go back and watch I see a lot of questions on watering that are a little bit wanting to get a, a little bit more specific and they really address that in a lot more detail and water wise so feel free to go back to the website or go to Sloat's website it's under the learn tab and then there's a gardening videos link at the bottom and they're all listed on there and all the outlines are there and whatnot um Again, if we didn't answer, if we didn't address your question, feel free to email all of us. You see their um, contact information there. And I think my email is on every single thing that you get for webinars. So we're all here to help and support you in this journey. I know that, um, you know, we're all, we all have to deal with it, drought tolerant gardening. So, um, you, know, you can do it, you can do yeah. it. We can keep our gardens uh, healthy yeah. Not always happy, but healthy through times of, uh, ex, you know, of drought. So that's, it's, it's, it, it just takes a few things and there's a lot of ways to get the most out of our water when we're um, able to reuse and recycle water. We can really just, you know, drench our soils if we wanted to, when we're reusing and recycling water. And then when we're watering from our gardens, from, you know, the city water, or from a well, we really wanna make sure we're very, very exact. We're really getting the water where we want it to go. And our intention is to get it where it's meant to be. So down in the root zones. Awesome. I think I'm gonna set up a laundry gr gray water system after seeing- It's so great. It's so great. It's just pools of water going out. I know, it's, free. it's like free water or something. So yeah, yeah. kind of free anyway. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, thank you again, both of you. I really appreciate you uh, being here tonight and uh, taking time with us and sharing your information. I look forward to the next presentation. Also keep in mind uh, the, the recording of this class will be available this Friday 
under our website. So everybody have a nice Wednesday evening. We're halfway through the week. So enjoy and hope to see you next week at the Summer Spotlight Series kickoff. Uh, we'll be making some fun cocktails. So anyway, have a lovely evening. Thanks for joining us. Happy gardening. Bye. Thank Bye. you.